Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our first class on Watership Down. I am so excited. <clears throat> um, before we get going, uh, of course, I, I'm, I, I'm really eager to uh, to jump into our discussion of Watership Down. I want to welcome you guys all back. I know we've uh, we've been away from the uh, Academy classes for a couple of weeks, and I think they're looking through the the list. It looks like there's uh, some some new people here. Um, so that's really great to see. Welcome to those of you who are new here. Um, for anyone who is new uh, and participating live, um, there's the, the little question box where you can type things in and I'll see your comments right away. There'll be a bunch of times when I'll be asking you guys questions and trying to respond to your comments, though there are quite a few people here tonight. So I, I, I have to apologize in advance for not being able to get to everything that everybody says, but, uh, um, but I'm definitely uh, very interested to hear what you guys have to say and what your thoughts are about our uh, first reading here tonight. Um, but first, I wanted to do uh, a couple quick announcements. First of all, as many of you know, um, the Mythgard Academy, you know, these th series of free courses have been made possible uh, by our fundraisers that we've run over the last couple years. This is officially the last class of the first season. Um, so we're, uh, we're ending our first uh, very successful and extremely fun year. Um, we've been having, for the last month or so, a little bit over a month, our fundraiser for the second year uh, to try to keep these things going. And, you know, we asked for, you know, on our fundraiser we were, we were shooting for the basics. You know, I mean, it costs, you know, some money to, to, to keep these things going and to keep everything available and to make sure that all of our all of our class sessions from all of the classes that we've done, not only our current classes, are, uh, are you know, continue to be remain available for free. So we, you know, set that goal, $14,000 to keep things running for this next year, um, and we absolutely blew that away in just a couple weeks. Um, and then we added a, a, a new goal that, you know, on top of continuing the classes like we've done this year, we're going to add a new wrinkle, and we're going to have a new series of guest lectures. You can hear from somebody other than me. Um, we're going to have a new series of guest lectures that will go throughout the year. And we're like, well, we'll do that, you know, if we can raise like another $12,000, Oh, we did that pretty quickly too. Um, and now we've moved past not only that now twenty-six thousand dollar goal, but now we're over thirty thousand dollars as of now. Um, we're now working towards some amazing things, kinds of things that I have been wanting to, to really do for a while, hoping that that Mythgard would be able to facilitate for a while, but hadn't even really planned to do that right away. Um, the kinds of things I'm thinking about, we really want to build a new website. We'd like to build a more active uh, community for the the sort of the fans and students of imaginative literature to be able to support more content again not just me uh, uh, for you guys and to be able to uh, you know enable more discussion and interaction there's there's a lot that we'd like to do that we just really can't do um, with our now quite old website so we want to be able to design a new website. Another thing I would really like to do is to be able to host regional events because of course if there's anything that's more fun than getting together and being able to discuss this stuff live with you guys online um, is to be able to actually get together in person and be able to hang out and have these kinds of discussions and you know we've, we've, we've done a little bit of that um, but uh, I mean certainly there are several people here I know um, who were present and indeed both of the organizers of the Midmoot event, that is the, the gathering of the, the, the Mid-Atlantic uh, Mythgardians, um, uh, which happened in Northern Virginia this past summer, um, which was fantastic. We, did, we got together and did a little like one-day mini-conference. It was absolutely awesome. Um, and it was really, really cool to be able to sort of go down and, and be able to bring people together from that region. We had people coming all the way from, you know, from Philadelphia Philadelphia, down the D.C. region, Baltimore, all that whole area kind of got together. It was really cool. We'd love to be able to, faci to facilitate more of these kinds of events, do special, you know, movie marathons and discussions, um, but of course actually arranging um, actually arranging uh, 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 local events is, you know, time-consuming and costly, so that was something that I've kind of has been in sort of a, a, a pipe dream mode for me for a while, but I'm really uh, excited about the fact that again, if we continue to raise a bit more money, then it's something that really we'll be able to 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 start doing, um, even in this coming year. So I'm really excited about that. So. Our fundraiser has just been a fantastic success. I'm so grateful for the support from you guys and just really excited to see what we can do and see what we can continue to expand and offer uh, during this during this coming year. Um, 
the second thing now that our fundraiser culminates in our big event. We did it last year. We're doing it again this year. Um, our big webathon event, which is actually coming up very soon. It's this coming. Um, it's it's this coming Saturday, Saturday, November eighth. It's going to start at five o'clock p.m. Eastern time, and going to go until ten o'clock ish. Uh, it's scheduled to end at ten o'clock, um, but as most of you know. Ending promptly is not my best strength, um, but we're gonna, you know, we're gonna do our best. Um, uh, it's gonna be really fun. We have a, we have, uh, we have four different segments planned. It's gonna be really cool. In the first one, in the first hour, I'm gonna be talking um, with Cat and Kurt from their podcast, Cat and Kurt's TV Review, um, and we're gonna be talking about Doctor Who. I have recently started watching Doctor Who, the new Who, for the first time, uh, and I've been really, I've been really, it's something I've been wanting to do for many years, and I finally have, uh, um, have gotten around to it. Um, and I've been really, really interested in it. So I'm going to be chatting with them. Um, they have a bunch of questions for me about my impressions of Doctor Who now that I've begun it, and I have a you know, bunch of things I want to ask them more uh, 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 more about. So anyway, we're, um, uh, that should be a lot of fun. So that, that'll be the first hour. We'll be talking Doctor Who. In the second hour, uh, Serena Higgins, who is the author of the Oddest Inkling blog um, on Charles Williams, and also Mythgard faculty member um, is going to be chatting with uh, with Ed Powell, our our wizard with a mind of metal and wheels, who is uh, our 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 the, the the head of the council of the Mythgard Academy. The two of them are going to be talking about. He's going to be interviewing um, Serena about about the Inklings. Yeah, a lot of people, the Inklings are a really amazing and fascinating group of people, and. Most people, I mean, they think about Tolkien a lot, and they'll often think about Lewis. Like, usually, sort of the inklings in people's minds means like Tolkien and Lewis, and our people are sort of vaguely aware that there was a crowd of other people involved. Um, but it, uh, it, it should be really cool to be able to, you know, uh, Professor Higgins is, is a fantastic uh, source. Um, for thinking more about the inkling. So it would be really great to get an opportunity to sort of learn, you know, hear a conversation um, that's sort of a little bit more, a little bit broader and more wide-ranging about the inklings in general. Um, then in the third segment, um, Professor Higgins and I are going to have, she's challenged me to a debate. And the subject of the, bait, of the debate is the Hobbit films. Of course, as most of you probably know, I've been defending the Hobbit films ever since they came out. I continue to defend them. And she wants to attack them. So she and I are going to debate on the subject of the Hobbit films with me, Pro, and her, Con. Uh, and we'll see how that goes. Those of you who uh, follow either one of us on Twitter, um, she's Oddest underscore Inkling, and I'm Tolkien Prof, um, have uh, been able to sort of see us sparring over the course of this week. We've been sort of pre gaming uh, on Twitter over the course of this week so, uh, so anyway that, that's been that's been fun but I'm really looking forward to uh, to our little debate on the Hobbit films uh, moderated by Laura Verkholtz uh, of Riddles in the Dark and then our final segment which is going to be a two hour segment is we're going to do a special episode of the Riddles in the Dark um, with me and Trish and Dave and Laura and we're going to be going through and looking at the Desolation of Smaug extended edition material. Last year at the end of the year things got really complicated, um, really busy um, leading up to the very end of season two of Riddles in the Dark, and I really felt we weren't able to really do justice to the extra material that we were given um, in An Unexpected Journey. So we're really glad to get the opportunity to do a full session just on the extended edition material from The Desolation of Smaug. So we'll be watching it together, and you guys can join in with us and, and, uh, um, and discuss that. So uh, we're, we're very much looking forward to that, too. Uh, Michael asks, uh, will these marathon parts be available in podcast? I'm not 100% sure some of them might be or parts of it might be. But it really is designed to be uh, primarily a live event, so I can't promise that 100% of it is going to be available later on, but certainly some parts of it will. Certainly the Riddles in the Dark part is going to be published as a Riddles in the Dark episode with the rest of them. I'm not sure that 100% of the rest of it is going to be available. Um, but... Uh, but anyway, we certainly are, are hoping you'll be able to attend, uh, uh, as many as, of you as possible will be able to attend. Um, 
But anyway, so 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 we'll see. So that's coming up again. That's coming up this coming Saturday. It should be a lot of fun. It's the end of our fundraiser. We're looking to you know it's the the final day where we're gonna, we're going to try to push through and uh, and achieve our fundraising goals for the year so that we can uh, we can really sort of put the capstone on this really exciting year coming up that we've uh, that we're now really really looking forward to. So. That's the story. That's what's that's what's coming up. That's what's been going on. Um, let me uh, just to uh, make sure that you guys all have it. Um, I'm going to for those of you who are who are attending here live. I'm going to put into the chat window um, of the um, of the webinar session. Uh, the registration link for the webinars uh, for the webathon. So if you haven't been able to register yet, that's the link right there. Uh, for those of you who are listening after the fact, you can find you go to the MythGuard Academy donation page, um, our campaign page. You can find that link <clears throat> up in the uh, up at the t in the top of the page. Um, also, I wanted to mention uh, Arthur Harrow had been reminding me of this. If you guys would like, and I know that some people like to be able to chat with each other. Uh, during the class sessions, if you have questions, things that you want to convey to me, you know, comments that you want to make, that you want me to see, uh, do enter those into your questions box here uh, in the GoToWebinar interface. For those of you who would like to also, or instead, chat with each other, <clears throat> if you go to the Watership Down page uh, on the MythGuard Academy page uh, uh, in uh, the on MythGuard.org, um, there should be a link in the bottom right hand corner for the uh, for our, our our class chat room, so you can join in the chat room with other students. I know there are some students there now um, uh, who are uh, who are are present. So anyway, if you um, uh, if you are able to, uh, uh, if you, if you're interested in doing that, wanted to make sure that you knew that that was uh, that that was happening. Um, okay, um, let's see. <laughs> Kay says, "I remember the days when teachers frowned on talking during class." See, Kay, as long as see, the thing is, one of the big problems with students talking to each other in class. One of the reasons that people disapprove of this is that, first of all, it's distracting to other people, right? But you know. If you don't, well, that's the great thing, right? Being about having that separate chat room is that it doesn't distract anybody. You know, if you want to do it, you can. It's fine. Um, you know, and uh, whether or not you can pay attention while doing that is uh, is you know that's kind of <laughs> that's kind of on you. But as this class is wholly elective, I have no compunctions whatsoever about it. Um, good. Okay. Let's talk about Watership Down. So tonight we begin Watership Down, a book I have been looking forward to talking about ever since uh, it was first mentioned um, by our uh, by our council of nominees last year. Watership Down is uh, one of the two books I was given uh, when I was. I think I was a little bit older. I might have been nine, maybe ten. Um, this is my original copy of Watership Down. Um, this was handed to me by my father, um, which was particularly special because my father reads very little fiction. But he he's the one who recommended this to me. In fact, I, I believe this is still the only work of fiction that he's ever recommended to me in his life. Um, and um, we, anyway, we, uh, this... You know, in that year, you know, about about twelve month, maybe eight eighteen month period, <clears throat> I was handed two books, um, which you know, the two of which really sort of changed my life and and be, have you know have really been a major part of my life ever since. One was The Hobbit, of course, and the other was Watership Down, um, and <clears throat> you know, this is a book that I have read and reread very regularly, um, and I uh, I find it. Absolutely remarkable. Um, it is one of the most moving and powerful books uh, that I know of. Um, so I'm. It's one of the books that, in some ways, I'm, I'm really excited to teach it. But I'm also a little bit sheepish um, uh, to teach it because it is. It's one that has always had such great meaning uh, for me personally. That's never stopped me from talking about Tolkien, so I, I, I reckon I'll manage. Um, but I wanted to sort of admit that from from the from the top. We'll also say um, that uh, I'm glad that you guys have joined us. I know there are many people, and this I find very very sad. There are many people who uh, saw all or part of the cartoon movie of Watership Down that came out um, without having read the having been fortunate enough to discover the book uh, on its own. 
um, and have been completely turned off from Watership Down and have this really strange idea. In fact, I think I've I've scheduled ten classes to talk about the book. Um, it's in four books, so you know, two classes for each of the four books plus two uh, sort of bonus classes. You know, just in case I fall a little behind or something. It's unlikely, but it might happen. Um, so I have scheduled ten class sessions. I think I'm going to have to go back and add an eleventh class session at the end. Because uh, I really do want to talk about the movie when we get to the end. Because I actually find the movie really fascinating from an adaptation standpoint. I'm really interested to sit down with you guys and talk it through. Because it's a movie that I find an appalling adaptation. Um, I find it just terrible. I've never, I've very rarely known a film which so perfectly succeeds in turning people off from the book. That it, you know, it, 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 it gets the book deeply wrong. But it's actually quite faithful to the plot of the book. It 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 commits comparatively few um, outrages um, on the plot of the book, and yet um, it's uh, uh, and yet it it is horrible. So and you know how does that happen? So I'll be interested to sit down and and try to work through with you guys um, to use the phrase of C.S. Lewis, as I'm so fond of, to, to, to discuss wherein its badness consists. Um, so we're definitely going to, going to, going to, going to talk about that. Um, yeah, Nancy says the tone is wrong all through. I totally agree. Um, but anyway, yeah, so we'll, 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 we'll come back to that later. For, uh, as of now, I'm forgetting about the film, which is never difficult for me, um, and I'm not going to refer to the film again until we get to the very. I promise, I'm not going to talk about the movie until we get to the very end. Um, but uh, but I do want to come back to it at the end. So as I said, I think I'm going to add uh, a, a class to the to the to the schedule at the end to to do that. But um, let's um, let's th let's think about the first book, the reading for today. First, I want to talk about Watership Down as a work of fantasy. This is, in some ways, I think, a, a categorization that might sort of surprise some people. Um, in one sense, of course, Watership Down might seem like it isn't a fantasy. It isn't a fantasy in the sense that it does not contain events in general which violate what happens in the everyday world. That is, um, there's no, you know, the, the the main way in which people, people don't always use this vocabulary, but the main way in which people generally um, identify, sort of categorize things as fantasy, is if the world of the story, right, to use Tolkien's vocabulary, the secondary world that the story creates, if there are major differences between that secondary world and our primary world. The most common, of course, is magic. Um, but again, there's, you know, so there's some kind of fundamental difference, such as people have magical powers, um, which differentiates the secondary world of the story from the primary world that we know. When people see that, they categorize the thing, the story, as fantasy. If that doesn't happen, right, then, uh, then generally it's something else, right? Um, Watership Down is complicated in that way, because again, it would seem to be, I mean, the, the world that's described here is very much our world, right? We don't have rabbits with magical powers. Um, as uh, Adams himself has explained, he, he, he deliberately made the choice in writing the story not to allow the rabbits to do anything that rabbits couldn't, you know, were like, that normal rabbits were like physically incapable of doing. Um, you know, so in that sense, it was to be a realistic novel about rabbits. Um, you know, okay, fine. So, so again, so that would seem like, well, then, in what sense is it a fantasy? Um, I think that it's a fantasy. Well, let me come back. Let me address another thing first um, as we get to that, because I do, I do consider it fantasy. But the first thing I want to establish before we even explain any further about why I think it's a fantasy is that it's not an allegory. <laughs> I know for those of you, especially those of you who took the Dune class and got like rocked back in your chairs by by a like 45 minute screed about allegory in the modern world, uh, quite on it, we're sort of ambushed by that during one of our Dune classes <laughs> last semester. Uh, don't worry, don't worry, I'm not going to do it again. Um, but, but yeah, see, Patrick and, and Nancy were both just, uh, were both just, uh, um, uh, we're both just uh, anticipating that. No, 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 no. no. Um, 
it's not an allegory. Um, and what I mean when I say here that it isn't an allegory, um, I would even say it's not even a. I, I would not even put this in the ca in the category of beast fable. And let me explain what I mean by that. A beast fable generally is a story. Um, uh, the the word fable um, is a uh, word means from uh, 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 Latin fabula, which sort of means story. But the way that that word fabula was used um, is basically a sort of a story that's used usually to illustrate something. I mean, often to illustrate sort of a moral point, as of course most famously with Aesop's fables, right? Um, where there's sort of a particular sort of take-home lesson or moral principle that's being illustrated by this story. Um, that's that's the idea of a fable, that, you know, you, you tell a story which you kind of bring in, um, whether it's in, you know, very, very commonly, very commonly in the Middle Ages, of course, in a sermon, in order to uh, to sort of illustrate a point or to make memorable a particular kind of uh, a, a particular kind of lesson that you're trying to, to convey. A beast fable, of course, is a story like that which has beasts as the main character. And the thing about beast fables, the, the really to me the defining element of beast fables, is it's a book that's about animals, but you're not really supposed to be thinking about animals. Um, to me, the classic. Uh, beast fable that I think people are most familiar with would be George Orwell's Animal Farm. Animal Farm is a wonderful beast fable, um, and it's a beast. It's it's a beast fable, not an allegory exactly, because if it were an allegory, if be, if if Animal Farm were an allegory, then you would have to say that like each of the different animals like represents a particular. You know, you 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 need to be able to draw equal signs, right? To say that like the you know the horse is either this person or this kind of person, and, and I don't think it, it 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 doesn't seem to me to work quite like that, but it is a beast fable in that, although the characters are animals, really we're supposed to be thinking about people, right? they kind of stand in, the animals stand in for people. The animal story is really just a vehicle to convey a story about humans. Um, Watership Down isn't like that. We are not supposed to be thinking about humans at all. These are not, you know, the, 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 the rabbits, in the fact that we're hearing these stories about rabbits, the rabbits are not being anthropomorphized. You say, well, they're, they're, they're talking, they're using human language. No, they're using rabbit language it's being translated to us for English. We hear the, as English, we hear them talking amongst each other. Um, and very much the effect of this story is we are hearing a translation from the Lapine with, with stray Lapine words left in only because there are not English equivalents for them. There is no word in English that means the same thing, thing that Tharn means or Silfle. Um, these are concepts which are crucial to rabbits, right, which are, are, are so um, sort of essentially a, a part of their own experience. Tharn, of course, that experience of, of, of freezing in, uh, in stultified panic. Um, and Silfle meaning to go out above ground to feed. These are things that we don't have words for, because why would humans need words for these things? But rabbits obviously would. Um, so so again, when there's not an English equivalent, we get the Lapine word untranslated, right? But everywhere else we get it in English. This is very much the effect of the story. Um, and you can tell on account of how they don't communicate with humans, there's no question of them speaking English, these rabbits, right? Which might be overheard. Again, that, 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 can, that sometimes happen in sto happens in stories. And very often in beast fables, you get humans and animals speaking to each other in the same language, right? Without any problem. Um, that's not what we're getting here. Now, uh, Kimberly asks a great question. So we should be understanding this as a translation, a translation by whom? We're not given that, Kimberly. Um, and I will say that's one, that's one way in which, like, if Tolkien had written this, it would be very different in several ways. But if Tolkien had written this, Kim, we would we, we would get that, right? We would get this the whole sort of like manuscript history. How how did this volume come down to us, right? We don't get that kind of a textual history. There's no um, there's no ex, there's no sort of framing explanation for who the narrator is, how the narrator came to know this, or anything like that. Um, that's um, it's just. There's no, there's no. I mean, we we might make up a story on our own, but the the book itself um, does makes no attempt uh, to make that to make that kind of connection. Um, but 
but again, so when I, when I when I talk about it as being a translation, again, I don't mean that we're given that kind of a textual framework of the story. I mean when we're hearing the rabbits talk. Um, this is clearly not rabbits who talk like people. This is us as readers being privileged to understand what the rabbits are saying to each other. And I think that the difference between those two things is profound in how we approach the story. Um, and that's why, I, you know, what this book does is much, much harder than just give a beast fable relating to humans, right? Sort of telling a story which could very well be told with human actors. Like, like Animal Farm could well have been to, you could tell the same story with people instead of, it would be a far inferior story. It's very effective the way that Orwell uses beast fable. But, you know, you could basically have told the same story with people instead of with animals. Um, you couldn't do the same story with people instead of with rabbits because this is fundamentally a story about rabbits. What this story does is very different from just addressing us and human concerns and inviting us to think about human concerns through, you know, with, with a rabbit story as the vehicle. Instead, what it does is it creates a secondary world, um, a secondary world which I find exceptionally believable, um, exceptionally easy to enter in and invest secondary belief in. And what it does is invite us into the world of rabbits, seeing things as the rabbits see them. And, uh, and that's pretty remarkable. I think, again, using some, uh, some of Tolkien's vocabulary here um, from his essay on fairy stories, one of, the, one of the great benefits, one of the great functions that he claimed for fantasy um, in that essay was what he called recovery. That is, we tend to go through life and the things that we, the things that are so wonderful um, and remarkable in this world, we see them and we marvel at them, but then they become familiar to us and we tend to take everything around us for granted. And one of the benefits of reading fantasy is that fantasy helps to reinvest the world around us in wonder. Once we have met Treebeard, we can never look at the trees in our backyard quite the same way again. That is recovery. We, trees are recovered to us. Now, when we look at a tree, um, we are more likely, having, enc having encountered in fantasy Treebeard and the Ents, we are much more likely to encounter a tree and recognize it as a growing and living thing in ways that we might not have before. Um, our own experience of our primary world um, is altered, is refreshed, um, is, uh, is, is informed and sometimes even corrected by the effect of having read the fantasy. Um, what Watership Down, uh, Watership Down, I think, accomplishes this superlatively. It takes a very mundane and everyday world and invites us to see it through new eyes, to see the world through the eyes of the rabbits. And it gives us an entirely new, it invites us into an entirely new way of looking at things. Let me give one really small example. Um, there are many that I could have pointed to, but... Um, Here's, this is right after they've entered the wood, when they've just fled from the warren. From the moment he heard it, he entered it, sorry, the wood seemed full of noises. There was a smell of damp leaves and moss, and everywhere the splash of water went whispering about. Just inside, the brook made a little fall into a pool, and the sound, enclosed among the trees, echoed as though in a cave. Roosting birds rustled overhead. The night breeze stirred the leaves. Here and there, a dead twig fell. And there were more sinister, unidentified sounds from further away, sounds of movement. To rabbits, everything unknown is dangerous. The first reaction is to startle, the second to bolt. Again and again they startled, until they were close to exhaustion. But what did these sounds mean, and where, in this wilderness, could they bolt to? Now, you think of the... Think of what... Adams has done in his description of this passage. First of all, he invites us into the sensual experience of the rabbits. That is, we are seeing and hearing and feeling this very commonplace woodland scene um, from their point of view. And you think about the way that he has described this, right? The way that he creates this effect. 
um, he starts us off close to the ground, right? The smell of damp leaves and moss, and they're hearing the splash of water down on their level. They've got the, the trees and the canopy of the trees above them, which is huge and really high over their head, right? And they hear it echoing like in a cave, right? The distant birds rustling overhead and the breeze stirring in the leaves far above them, and they're conscious even of these small things that we probably wouldn't even notice, like the sound of falling twigs occasionally, right? And then we've got these other sounds. Now, of course, if we as humans were walking through these woods, not only would we probably not notice a whole bunch of these uh, a whole bunch of these stimuli, right? We probably wouldn't even perceive them, right? Like the sounds of movement would probably be stilled, as would the rustling of roosting birds, even if we did hear that or listen to that um, when we were there, right? Instead, we hear sort of this imaginative conception of a peek into, you know, the native woods, woods without human beings there. And then more importantly, especially in that second paragraph, what the experience of that was to rabbits. Now, not only imagine what it would look like and sound like, but again, what it would feel like. Um, Patrick Summers makes a great point. He says, you know, woods, which we see as really calm, peaceful places, are terrifying to a tiny rabbit who find the noises of nature threatening, because of course they certainly are, right? The things which might be threatening uh, to uh, uh, to a mouse. I mean, I have uh, a, a pair of weasels that live right outside my house uh, over on the side. We see them sometimes from my living room window, um, especially in the winter time. And uh, and but they're so shy. Uh, you know, when uh, when my, my my children and I get to see them, you know, we're like, oh, shh, be very quiet. Don't disturb the weasels, right? Um, but uh, but of course. <laughs> to the rabbits, right? You know, I mean, we, we, we very rarely see this because they're so shy of us. Obviously, to the rabbits, they're an enormous threat. Any small, tiny movement um, or sound. Um, might, so we are invited to think of this, uh, you know, to, to imagine ourselves in this place and not just the interpretation, um, not just the interpretation of those particular, like, menacing sounds, but of their whole mindset, right? Why is it that the woods are threatening not just because they don't know what those sounds are and to them anything unknown is dangerous and they're quite legitimately afraid that something is going to spring out of the bushes and try to kill one or more of them, um, but the fact that they, you know, something which humans just don't normally think about, right? Ways in which we are not accustomed to thinking. The idea of how exposed, how terrified they are simply to be out of reach of a hole to bolt to. You know, this is the fundamental thing in a rabbit's life, to have, uh, to have, uh, to have a hole, to have a, a burrow that you can dive down into um, when enemies come. And recognizing that and the way that we're introduced to that during this segment as they're going through the woods helps us to see and it certainly gains you know Sarah King as as you say um, a huge respect for the bravery you know for the for the for the intrepidity um, of Hazel and the rest of the rabbits right that that it, what this meant to them it means so much more to them than it would mean to us you know, to a group, to a, to a similar group of human beings making a similar journey, even if, even, even to scale, right? Even if you sort of scale the journey up and you would imagine people, you know, going on a, a multi-day hike through unknown wilderness, they too might be in danger from unknown sounds, you know, they too would be, would be at risk in certain ways, but yet they would not have this basic experience, right? This, the, the, the fundamental... Um, threat that having no holes to bolt to is. Um, so he does, um, He, I think that Adams does a really great job, and the way that his narrator does this, it's so gentle, the way that we're brought into the rabbit point of view. You know, he, it's, it, he never sort of forces it upon us, he just sort of all along through, through the kinds of details that he emphasizes, as here he did that first description in that first paragraph. Um, the, you know, occasionally he'll insert one of those paragraphs where he explains things about rabbits to us, um, but most of the time 
he just sort of invites us to come along and we begin through our acquaintance with the rabbit characters um, and listening to their talk with each other to understand more and more about their values and how they look at the world and we are invited to come alongside them and look at the world in their and look at their world in their way this fundamentally is why I categorize this as a fantasy. I think that the way that the secondary world is created, the kind of imaginative activity that we as readers are being invited to do, we are being invited to step outside our world, our normal human world, in a way as profoundly as we are, <clears throat> you know, when we find ourselves in Bag End at the beginning of The Hobbit, or when we go through the wardrobe into Narnia. I think that, uh, you know, the difference here, it's 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 different, but I think that the similarities there are really are really profound. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think yeah, again, I think Adams does such a fantastic job. He never really breaks this frame, you know. Um, and and the way that he sort of recruits us to think, there are so many ways in which, of course, the rabbit point of view is different from ours. Um, you know, the way that he invites us into this new psychology. Um, and, you know, and he does this without, without satire, right? Without mere reversal. Um, sort of taking for granted the rabbit point of view and inviting us to take it for granted too. I, I mean, for instance, um, it would be possible he could have sort of invited us, spoken as the narrator speaking as one human to another, um, kind of looking down on the rabbits, or inviting us to look down on the rabbits. Um, and that even when they did something great within their own measure, um, we might still have looked at them in a sort of a condescending way, right? We might have been tempted to sort of pat the, the brave little rabbit on the head, right? His narrator never takes that approach. Um, uh, he he builds this world so convincingly um, and never really breaks it. And we, we are, you know, we are instead uh, one with them. Yes, Kate Neville says he's very respectful um, of the rabbit world. Rabbits can be a joke, but not in this world. Kate, I agree, especially when, you know, one of the things, of course, that is, you know, sort of, you know, as I've already alluded to, fundamental about the rabbit world is what one might be tempted from a human point of view to call their cowardice, right? They run away from everything. Um, you know, they're, 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 they're scared all the time. They startle so easily. Um, and it would be really easy to give in to some kind of patronizing tone or even some kind of like mock heroic there, I, you know, sort of, you know, them as sort of anti-heroes. Um, but no, we don't get that. We don't ever get anything like that at all. Um, the fact that what you do is bolt for cover when danger comes in, this is part of the world. I mean, it's, it's just part of being sane, you know, that you would look at the world that way. Um, and uh, I, I, just, I, I find that his success at that uh, is, uh, is, is, is really remarkable. Um, yeah, Kimberly says, rabbits have social conventions like we do, just different social conventions. Um, yeah, and she says, I, I feel like this passage really served to emphasize how these rabbits were breaking out of traditional rabbit behavior. Um, she says, this is my first time reading, but already I have the feel of contrast between unnatural versus natural rabbit behavior is somewhat of a theme. I agree with you, Kimberly, when we come back and talk about uh, some of this a little bit more later on. Um, yeah, and, and thinking about this rabbit worldview that we're invited into, um, I want to look at their. I, I want to look at the rabbit mythology. You know, Philip, you were just referring to that, um, and of course, it won't surprise you to hear that I'm very interested in the rabbit mythology and the stories of El Herrera. So let's look at the at the this their their uh, cosmogony here. Long ago, Frith made the world. He made all the stars too, and the world is one of the stars. He made them by scattering his droppings over the sky, and this is why the grass and the trees go so th grow so thick on the world. Frith makes the rivers flow. They follow him as he goes through the sky, and when he leaves the sky, they look for him all night. Frith made all the animals and birds, but when he first made them, they were all the same. The sparrow and the kestrel were friends, and they both ate seeds and flies. 
The fox and the rabbit were friends, and they both ate grass. And there was plenty of grass and plenty of flies, because the world was new, and Frith shone down bright and warm all day. Now, El Herrera was among the animals in those days, and he had many wives. He had so many wives that there was no counting them, and the wives had so many young that even Frith could not count them, and they ate the grass and the dandelions and the lettuces and the clover, and El Herrera was the father of them all, Bigwig growled appreciatively. And after a time, went on Dandelion, after a time the grass began to grow thin, and the rabbits wandered everywhere, multiplying and eating as they went. Okay. Um... Uh, what do we get here? Focus on that first paragraph. Now, what do you notice about rabbit mythology? Notice that we never get any description of Frith. Frith, of course, in one sense is the sun, um, but he's also, and I use this word with deliberate vagueness, personified. Right? That is, we get Frith not, you know, when Frith speaks um, and interacts, we don't get Frith as merely a talking sun, right? What does Frith look like when Frith walks about on the earth um, and takes form and you know meets with Elahera later in this uh, in this uh, story? What does he look like, right? Um, well, he sounds awfully lot like a rabbit, right? Um, scattering his droppings over the sky, for instance, and of course, rabbit droppings are small and pellet-like, um, so they would look the planets could very well be Frith's droppings. Um, uh, I'd be interested, just, I'm, I'm very interested to hear your own observations about these, um, about their myths. What are some things that you notice? What are some things that we learn about the rabbits and the rabbit culture and the rabbit worldview from, uh, uh, from, from, this, from this description, from this story, from these first, first two paragraphs of the story? Um, it doesn't explicitly say that Frith is a rabbit, and, and, and indeed, in the in the context of the story, he's obviously not a rabbit, right? In, I mean, not, not literally a rabbit. I mean, El Herrera is the father of the rabbits, and Frith is obviously not one of the children of El Herrera, so he's clearly not a rabbit, and yet he's spoken of in vaguely lapinomorphic, uh, to <laughs> coin a word, right, lapinomorphic terms. Um, this seems this seems to me exactly right. Um, he's he's spoken of in lapinomorphic terms with exact in exactly the same sense in which God so often is spoken of in anthropomorphic terms uh, in most of human mythology, right? Um, and that's perfectly natural, perfectly understandable. Um, notice some of the things that we get, some of the other sort of mythic touches that we get in that first, in that first paragraph. Um, uh, yeah, okay, let's see. Um, good. Kay says, it's incredible that there's some connection between our Earth and stars made by rabbits who do not practice scientific study of space. Good, yes, there's this sort of intuition among the rabbits that the world, the world is one of the stars. Right, that is really interesting, isn't it? Um, and I don't know sort of where to go with that, but the idea that he has scattered his droppings all over the sky—that seems to be the root, um, you know, sort of the root image of that particular metaphor and why the world is understood to be one of the uh, one of the stars. It's like this: the whole sky, you know, all of space. Though the rabbits don't use that word. Um, is like a great field scattered with droppings, right? Um, and so one of these is the Earth, and the rest of them are presumably the stars. So we get here in this this combination, right, of both uh, both an understanding of the world and an understanding um, of uh, of the stars and how and how they work. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Kate is interested that uh, Elohera's fatherhood uh, is stressed. Um, is 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 stressed. Uh, the, the emphasis on the fertility of the rabbits clearly something that they're quite proud of. Um, yeah, and Kat, it's clear that he's a sun god. Frith is um, uh, because they speak. I mean, even in the the two the two lapine phrases which mean in the middle of the day and in the middle of the night. Of course, as uh, of course we're told, rabbits don't 
do precise timekeeping, but vaguely midday and vaguely middle of the night is uh, Ni Frith and Fu Inle. Frith and Inle are vaguely the sun and the moon. Um, so Frith is the sun, and Frith is looking down and shining down bright and warm all day. He's in a sense identified with the sun, but as I say, he's not exclusively identified with the sun. Um, yeah, April thinks it's important that Frith is not a human. I agree. I had, I will I will make a, a confession, April. Um, when I first read this book as a child, I shamelessly, um, you know, with uh, with unself conscious anthropomorphism, imagined um, all of the not explicitly animal characters, uh, especially Lord Frith and Prince Rainbow, as being animals, or, or being humans, rather. Um, and then it was only later on when I was like, wait, Juan, what possible justification have I imagined Lord Frith walking around as a human being? Um, uh, it, uh, it, it, it certainly wouldn't have been. Notice, of course, as several of you are pointing out, this begins with this sort of Edenic world. Um, and that, too, I think, is a really fascinating point of contact that he makes between the rabbit mythology and traditional human mythologies that we know of. The rabbit mythology, as so many mythologies do, the rabbit mythologies begin with a concept of a golden age. Right? That there was a golden age when all was in plenty and everyone was at peace and, and you didn't, you know, thinking of the Greco-Roman golden age here, you know, there was no agriculture and there was no trade and everyone just was able to get all of the food that they, you know, just sort of reach out and take the, the, the fruit from the trees that they needed and, um, uh, you know, and, and human beings declined from the golden age and the perfection of the moral perfection and and uh, and and justice and everything all the way down to the iron age at the end which of course meant something very different for the romans say than it means to us that phrase um uh uh, uh, Catherine Finn really likes the idea that the rivers are following Frith. I like that too. Why do the rivers flow, right? This seems to be a question which underlines this, right? Why do the rivers flow? Well, the rivers flow because they're following Frith, right? He keeps moving, so they keep moving to follow him. Of course they do. That's actually a very medieval idea. Um, uh, why, why do things move? Why does the world go round? Be because, it, because it wants to. Um, out of love is the medieval answer, which I think is far better than the modern scientific a answer, by the way. Um, certainly better from a mythic standpoint. The modern scientific myth about these things is quite vague and, and, uh, uh, and not very compelling at all. Um, but anyway, there... Um, um, yeah, we'll see how it, Michael, we'll get back to, to Prince Rainbow. When we, I, we haven't gotten to him yet, but in later stories, we'll get to Prince Rainbow. Um, and... Uh, now we do get some kind of transgression here, right? We get an end, a fall from the Golden Age. There's no Garden of Eden-esque breaking of a prohibition, right? We, we've got no knowledge, of, you know, tree of the knowledge of good and evil here, um, but we do have a decline from the Golden Age, and it starts with the sort of the consequence of the fecundity of the rabbits, right? That the rabbits are multiplying and eating and so the grass is growing thin because the rabbits are overpopulating the joint. Um, that seems to be sort of the source. So Frith introduces a new age, right? He's going to come and he's going to give each of the animals a gift and he's going to set them each apart. He's going to establish this new natural order. It is important to recall that that comes from Frith. The idea that there are all of these enemies out there, right? The fact that the rabbits are surrounded by Elil is not because the world is corrupt. Frith designed it that way. It's part of the plan. There is, in this mythology, an acceptance of death and suffering, um, which is, seems to me very different from many other mythologies um, that it's there's there isn't it's it's not like a consequence of wrongdoing on their part they didn't I mean, the rabbits aren't doing anything wrong I mean they're creating a problem but it's not their fault right they've not sinned in that sense but Frith 
sees that he needs to change the rules. So he introduces a new, he gives a gift to each of the animals. And the gift he gives to the Elil is the desire to hunt and eat rabbits and the skills and tools with which to do that. Um, and that, I think, is really interesting. That seems to me a really important thing to recall in this. And I would say, in general, um, it's one of the things, thinking about the rabbit worldview, it's one of the things that's very different about the rabbit point of view than about the human point of view. is a very different view towards death and killing. And we'll come back and look at this in a couple other places. Um, one place, at least, I want to look at tonight. Um, killing is not seen <clears throat> as a fundamentally criminal thing, certainly not under all circumstances, even their enemies. Foxes aren't wicked for wanting to kill rabbits. Um, they're not villains, they're enemies, but they're not villains. Um, it's natural for Elon to want to kill rabbits. That was a gift um, that Frith gave them, that Lord Frith gave them, and he gave to the rabbits a different gift. Um, yeah, Kate, as Kate Neville says, the myth shows an understanding of the way the world works and of their strengths and weaknesses as a species. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to look at El Herrera, and in particular, the blessing of El Herrera, as he invites Frith to bless his bottom as it sticks out of the hole. Then, said Dandelion, Frith felt himself in friendship with Elahrera, and would not give up, who would not give up, even when he thought the fox and the weasel were coming. And he said, very well, I will bless your bottom as it sticks out of the hole. Bottom, I love how he addresses the bottom. Bottom, be strength and warning and speed forever, and save the life of your master. Be it so. And as he spoke, Elahrera's tail grew shining white and flashed like a star, and his back legs grew long and powerful, and he thumped the hillside until the very beetles fell off the grass stems. He came out of the hole and tore across the hill faster than any creature in the world, and Frith called after him, Elahrera, your people cannot rule the world, for I will not have it so. All the world will be your enemy, prince with a thousand enemies, and whenever they catch you, they will kill you. But first they must catch you, digger, listener, runner, prince with a swift warning. Be cunning and full of tricks, and your people shall never be destroyed. And El Ahrera knew then that although he would not be mocked, yet Frith was his friend. And every evening, when Frith has done his day's work and lies calm and easy in the red sky, El Ahrera and his children and his children's children come out of their holes and feed and play in his sight, for they are his friends, and he has promised them that they can never be destroyed. Notice how the blessing of Elahrera, the way the sort of the heroism of Elahrera, what you know, his 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 being blessed with the gift of rabbits, right? Him sort of representing rabbit kind in this moment. Um, notice how again, far from inviting us to see these things from a human point of view, right? You will be able to, you know, run away really fast. Um, again, that would seem to be not the gift that a human would value or ask for, right? When something dangerous comes, you'll be able to run away swiftly. I'll make you even swifter at running away. <clears throat> Well, that's not what we would want, right? We would want to fight. We would want to be able to overcome it in some way. We'd want to... But this is heroism to the rabbits, right? Notice, too, where it started. The, the running away is only the third thing, right? What are the first two consequences that we get described as, uh, uh, as, as the, you know, the, the, the gifts, the blessing of the bottom of El Ahrera, right? First, his tail, right? Secondly, his thumping. Right, that he's able to that he that he he's able to uh, to to stamp on the ground. Why? What does that uh, What does that tell us? What does that show us? What do we learn about rabbit mythology and the rabbit worldview from that? Good cat and Kate, absolutely, warning others, 
right? Theirs is a fundamentally communal point of view. <clears throat> the first two things that they value most about the gifts that Elahera, that, that Frith has given to Elahera are the ability for them to help each other. Exactly, Yana, to warn your fellow rabbits. Um, you know, even and even as he's as he's addressed, you know, he's he is the prince with the swift warning, right? Um, that they as rabbits will work together in order to survive their enemies. Um, they will be cunning and full of tricks. As Elahera is cunning and even cheeky to Lord to Frith, who won't be mocked, right? He's not going to have that. Um, uh, but but yeah, exactly. So we see them able to communicate, you know, to, to be able to communicate in a couple different ways, both uh, both from the uh, both from the thumping and from the uh, and from the, the the flashing of his tail, and then of course from his from his running can run faster than any creature on earth, and therefore is able to escape. The whole value, right? The whole heroism of Elahera is him being able to escape from any situation, but also the fact that he can that he is so cunning and full of tricks, right? He cannot be stopped. Nobody can keep Elahera out of a garden, that he is a mind to raid, right? And it's sort of the set of values that go along with it are very different. Rabbits are not are not uh, they don't have sort of chivalric values, right? Much at all, right? Um, the kind of the that sense of honor or something like that, that's not what the rabbits are what what the rabbits are about, right? Um, but we can see what they do value and the way in which Elahera is set up um, as their hero, and we see this is the, this story shows the hope and the faith of the rabbits, right? How they this is what they rest upon this promise. Lord Frith's promise that they can never be destroyed. We see that being repeated first within the frame of the story, and then at the end, the the you know this is the very this is Dandelion, the storyteller's conclusion of the story. He comes back and reemphasizes this. Right, the take home message from this story is that the rabbits will because of the of the the gifts that Lord Frith has given them, they will never be able to be destroyed. But notice also how it's tied to their actions, right? Um, that is, again, be cunning and full of tricks, and your people shall never be destroyed. That is not sort of formally, but implicitly a conditional statement, right? Your people shall never be destroyed so long as you are cunning and full of tricks, right? Um, they are actively involved in that. The rabbits are not fatalistic in this way. Um, they have a they have a role. They have a responsibility to be cunning and full of tricks. Um, El Herrera is not you know you know what he's given what his his gift gives him a chance to survive right. But it's up to him to use his gifts against the other gifts that are given to the other animals. Um, yes, good uh, good. I like the way that Ethan Pyle says it. It's not simply a promise. There's an injunction there as well. Absolutely. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I good. And Kay says even in that, e even in that, you know, that they can never be destroyed. Even in that, it's communal. For of course, a single rabbit can be destroyed at any time. Yes, and they will be destroyed lots of times, right? Whenever they catch you, they will kill you, and they do, right? It's you know, rabbits are are killed very frequently. Um, Individual rabbits, okay, right? But rabbitry as a whole um, will never be destroyed so long as they are cunning and full of tricks. Um, and Michael, I agree. Uh, Michael emphasizes how you know sort of trickiness, wiliness is is often viewed negatively uh, in human culture, as is running away, as is fleeing. Um, but it's Elahera's special positive gift, absolutely. Um, again, I think one of the things which to me is so important about this story as we get it quite near the beginning um, of the book is it gives us a great deal of insight into the whole into sort of the values of rabbit society um, yeah yeah um, good good 
Yeah, Yana uh, mentions, you know, it's, it's that it's, it's, it's very thoughtful and interesting since rabbits are really a very communal species, unlike their relatives, the hare, uh, which are mentioned a few times in the book. Yeah, hares, hares are more solitary. Rabbits are communal. Um, and there is that sense of, that sense of distance. Um, it's almost as if one of the things that El O'Hara has, d or that, excuse me, that Frith has done um, in this story is to bring them closer together, right? Rather than them just sort of spreading out and taking over the world, right? Now they are under attack and they are forced to come together, um, even in the nature of the gifts that he gives to them, right? Um, it, he does not enable them to be able to stand up toe-to-toe, uh, -to -toe, uh, you know, with a cat or a fox, though more on that later. Um, but, uh, um, but instead, he gives them the ability uh, the, 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 the necessity to hold together. Um, yeah, good, good. Um, yeah, Michael also says it's interesting how rabbits can simultaneously be trustworthy and deceitful. Um, yeah, the question about sort of uh, lying and deceit has a very different status in, uh, um, in, in their world, and we'll see that in different... Um, it will be interesting to watch that in, in other El Herrera stories that we get later on. Um, my favorite moment in this first story, however, is the brief interruption of the story that we got right before this last section. All the rabbits had heard the story before, on winter nights when the cold draft moved down the warren passages and the icy wet lay in the pits of the runs below their burrows, and on summer evenings in the grass under the red may and the sweet carrion-scented elder bloom. Dandelion was telling it well, and even Pipkin forgot his weariness and danger and remembered instead the great indestructibility of the rabbits. Each one of them saw himself as Elahera, who could be impudent to frith and get away with it. The way that they apply themselves, again, notice how they themselves connect. First of all, again, we get these, notice how Adams is so brilliant at sprinkling these little references, right? Sprinkling these little, um, these little glimpses into the life of rabbits and the experience of rabbits, right? Imagine being a rabbit snug in your burrow on a winter night, right? Um, and you know that that those the the very tactile images of the cold draft and the icy wet in the pits of their runs, because of course rabbits dig runs that go down and then dip up to the burrow, so that any water and things, you know, stops in the well and doesn't just drain down into the burrow. That's how rabbit war rabbit burrows are constructed. So that's the that's what he means by the pits of the runs below their burrows, um, and then again that image of them sort of lounging in the grass uh, in on, on on summer evenings, really helping us to sort of put ourselves into into the uh, the, the rabbit position. James points out um, how how persistently we get these very detailed descriptions of the grasses and plants. Absolutely, that is sort of the number one priority everywhere, right, is sort of looking at the, at the, the different, they're, they're constantly aware um, of all of the different grasses and plants uh, that we see, that we are shown uh, in this story. But notice also here, of course, the connection, the way that the rabbits listen to this story, right? The way that they they identify with El Herrera. Each one saw himself as El Herrera, right? Um, but in a, but there's also this sense in which they, uh, you know, their relationship to the story, how the story sort of means more to them. They are able to get outside their current position. I mean, I used the my, my subtitle here. Applicability, of course, is. Um, uh, is another piece of Tolkien vocabulary, um, you know, when he talks about the applicability of stories. Um, they certainly are applying it to their own condition, but it's not even as conscious as that, right? It's not like the rabbits are sitting around there saying, well, we're scared and we're tired and we don't know what to do and we're, you know, we, we, we're, you know, we're under threat here. Um, but I can remember, now I'm being reminded by this story that Frith has promised that rabbits are never going to die out and I'm going to, like, you know, invest in the sort of faith in that, you know, in that idea and stop worrying so much about my current situation. You know, they don't, they don't think about it like that. They're not applying it to their situation. Instead, they are entering into 
the story. They enter into the story imaginatively with great completeness, right? And it seems to be a uh, uh, it seems to be a sort of a corollary to the communal nature of the rabbits. Um, they connect, they identify, they experience this thing together. Um, it's not just that each one of them is El Herrera, they're all El Herrera at the same time. They see, El, they see them, all of themselves in El Herrera and therefore also El Herrera in all of them, right? Um, and, uh, you know, again, we get here the Warren mindset, I think, of the rabbits, and we'll come back, we'll see other examples of this uh, later on. Um, I want to now go looking at specifically some of the uh, some of the, the characters of the story um, and the plot as we get it to this point. I'm hoping to get as far as talking about Fiverr and his prophetic visions, um, but um, but I want to start with Hazel um, as a protagonist and looking at uh, and looking at the characters. What makes Hazel different? What does Hazel do? What does Hazel bring to the table as a leader, right? Well, the main thing that we get, for, and by the way, Hazel is one of my favorite examples. I mean, he would be on my short list. Of, you know, if I had to, if I were asked to give a, you know, a list of uh, fictional characters uh, who provide a leadership model that I think, uh, you know, should be followed, Hazel would be very much on my short list. But, um, one thing that I would want to point out is this sort of revolutionary idea that he articulates at the beginning of the story. The last, this is when Bigwig joins them. <clears throat> the last thing Hazel had expected was the immediate support of a member of the Ausla. It crossed his mind that although Bigwig would certainly be a useful rabbit in a tight corner, he would be a difficult one to get on with. He certainly would not want to do what he was told, or even asked, by an outskirter. I don't care if he is in the Ausla, thought Hazel. If we get away from the Warren, I'm not going to let Bigwig run everything, or why bother to go? But he answered only, good, we shall be glad to have you. As I have suggested this is kind of a revolutionary idea. Um, see what I mean by that? In the animal world, this is kind of a big deal. I don't care if he is in the Ausla. Who are the Ausla? How do you get in the Ausla? Mostly, especially in this Warren. Who, who's uh, who's the Ausla? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Philip, Michael, the the big ones, right? The ones who are bigger and stronger than the rest of them. Um, the ones who can fight more. Yeah, you know, the heaviest rabbit. So there's a lot of emphasis on weight. Right? You've got some weight coming. Um, they, they talk about weight more than size because weight is what is practically useful. Right? Um, for a rabbit, you know, you think of like a human fighter, the strength of your upper body might be so, you know, if, if someone who is, who is really strong is going to have an advantage over someone who doesn't, you know, so like when I punch you in the face, it's going to hurt more if I'm really, really strong, right? Similarly, um, if my reach is really long, right, there might be a big difference between my reach and somebody else's reach, right? So that's, with rabbits, that's, you know, size and those things not really so much of an issue, right? But weight, weight makes a big difference. Um, you know, when you're, uh, you know, when you're, when you're wrestling, weight. There's a reason why you know they divide high school wrestlers into weight classes, right? Because how much weight you have makes a really big difference. Um, so, so anyway, so they very much. Emphasize weight, but that's who the Ausla is, right? Um, yeah, Thomas Johnson says uh, Hazel is questioning the survival of the fittest worldview that the others take for granted. Absolutely, right? What could be more natural than just? I mean, it, it it would be the perfectly normal thing for you know when Bigwig says I'll join for everybody to be like, great, Bigwig's coming. Bigwig is like one of the biggest and strongest rabbits in the Warren. He's in the Ausla, right? And he's a junior member of the Ausla. He's relatively young it seems. But it's but Bigwig is really big and really tough. So clearly, Bigwig is obviously the leader, right? He's clearly the boss because like those who are smaller obey the ones who are bigger. Of course that's how it works. Again, from a human point of view, we would tend to sort of bristle at that idea, right? Um, Hazel's idea might not sound too far-fetched, right? Um, 
But again, this isn't a beast fable, right? We're not supposed to be thinking about people. From a rabbit point of view, um, what he's what he's thinking about here really is kind of a big deal. Um, he's he he questions this, right? This isn't this isn't how it should be. Well, so how should it be then, Hazel? How should things work exactly? This is not just to also. I mean, at the time, it kind of sounds like. I'm sick of this. Remember the like the the conflict with Toad Flax over the cowslip, right? Um, they you know uh, Fiverr finds the cowslip, which is which is a delicacy, and uh, and and Hazel and Fiverr are starting to eat it, and then Toad Flax of the Owlsla comes in and pushes them off, right? Um, cowslip are for Owlsla, he says, right? And and Hazel's all like, I'm sick of it. I'm not going to take this any longer, right? So again, it it sounds potentially here like he's just sort of rebelling. Like, it's merely selfish, right? In fact, it, potentially, I'm not saying, of course, that it is, but potentially, this sounds like it could be a bad thing on Hazel's part, a defective thing for Hazel. Like, dude, why are you rocking the boat? Why are you not going with the communal thing, right? Of course you obey the people who are stronger than you are, and therefore also, of course, best able to protect the Warren. Um, no. He's not going to do that, right? But I can, But it's not just... It's, it becomes quickly clear that the difference in Hazel's perspective is not just that he's being uppity, right? That he wants something for himself. Um, yeah, Nancy, as Nancy points out, um, she says, I was noticing that not only is Hazel not the strongest of the rabbits, he's also not the smartest or the best storyteller or the prophet. He's the one who isn't special except how he relates to the other rabbits. Exactly. There's very little that is special in that way um, about uh, about you know about hazel they're just and what he does do the way in which he is being counterintuitive in what seems to be even countercultural within the culture of his warren is to think about the, about rabbits and how they should be interacting differently look at how he does think look at how he um, here's sort of an example um, we think about the the function that the different rabbits take. You know, Nancy, you were talking about the advantages that these other rabbits have. Notice how uh, Hazel notices, um, even in the midst of everything else, how fast Dandelion is. He's like, whoa, Dandelion is really fast. Unusually fast, even for a rabbit, right? And then Dandelion tells the story, and he's like, Dandelion was a really good storyteller. And then, of course, we get Blackberry's moment. Hazel, he said quickly, that's a flat piece of wood. Like that piece that closed the gap by the green loose above the warren. You remember? It must have drifted down the river. So it floats. We could put Fiverr and Pipkin on it and make it float again. It might go across the river. Can you understand? Hazel had no idea what he meant. Blackberry's flood of apparent nonsense only seemed to draw tighter the mesh of danger and bewilderment, as though Bigwig's angry impatience, Pipkin's terror, and the approaching dog were not enough to contend with. The cleverest rabbit among them had evidently gone out of his mind. He felt close to despair. Um, this, again, is, is, is to me such a wonderful example of how... Again, how this is not a beast fable, but rather a fantasy in which we are being invited to invest, um, to train ourselves to look at things from a rabbit point of view. Even concepts which seem so obvious and simple to human beings, right? The stuff that things float and that you can put things on them and they will float. The idea that to a rabbit this is going to be utterly and completely alien, right? Um, and we see Hazel to, to Hazel... Um, Blackberry has just had this insight. And you notice Blackberry. You're not paying attention to anything else, right? Blackberry is kind of a specialist, right? This, the, the, you know, there's a dog coming, okay, and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and you find Hazel's worried about Fiverr and picking. Blackberry is like, hey, look, a piece of wood. Isn't that interesting? And he goes over to explore and to investigate it, right? And he, 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 and he figures something out. Um, you know, so he's, he's Blackberry, of course, uh, is the brains. Uh, of course, if you're also suspecting that my subtitle of the uh, of this slide is a, uh, a veiled Winnie the Pooh reference, you are exactly correct. Um, the brain of Pooh is the name that Winnie the Pooh gives to the boat that he um, that he thinks of. 
or rather, I'm sorry, Christopher Robin names it the brain of Pooh in honor of Pooh because Pooh thought of it. Um, but anyway, um, Hazel though quickly, uh, you know, he he manages he manages he does he, he doesn't really understand. He is not as smart as Blackberry, right? But he gets the fact that Blackberry is smart. He perceives the fact that Dandelion is fast. Remember, these guys, right? Dandelion and Blackberry are the first two that we really get to know in this way, that we get to see that there's something really special about. But again, we see all of the other rats. You know, Hazel is the one, is, our, is not exactly our point of view character. It's not a first person narrative, of course, but the, the, the narration sticks closest to Hazel's point of view. And so through, the, through that narration, which is so close to Hazel, we see the other rabbits largely from Hazel's perspective. And of course, what we see, what we are reminded that Hazel is seeing all the way through, is that he's paying attention to them. He's noticing them. Remember, that was the corollary of what he was saying before about not wanting to just let, let Bigwig run everything, right? If you just let the strongest rule then it means there's only one thing that matters about a rabbit. A rabbit is only worth as much as he weighs, essentially, right? That bigger, heavier rabbits weigh, you know, I about to say weigh much more. Yes, yeah, yes, they do. Bigger, heavier rabbits are worth much more than the other rabbits, right? And so these outskirters are not worth anything, right? But of course, Hazel sees can qu he quickly perceives that they are, and we are introduced to the essential worth of every one of those rabbits. Some of them, in fact, do have quite extraordinary talents, which would almost certainly have gone to waste in the old warren had they remained. Nobody would have valued the speed of Dandelion. Nobody would have valued the brains of Blackberry. Fiverr, um, well, nobody values Fiverr at all, um, but Hazel does perceive all these things, and Hazel does value all these things. So again, the paradigm that he has shifted from the way that things were done in his Warren is there's more to life, there's more to being a rabbit than just being stronger. It's not just that the strongest and the best should rule. Um, so... Uh, yeah, yeah, good. Yana says he he found it interesting um, that it's 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 Bigwig of all the others that gets the raft plan better than any of the rest of them. I like that too, Yana. He does resist. I think Adams does a great job of resisting merely pigeonholing the rabbits. Right? Here's the smart guy, and he's the quick guy, and he's Bigwig is the biggest and the toughest, but he's not dumb. Right? Um, he quickly gets it. He gets it more than most of the other rabbits do. Um, and, uh, and and is the one who thinks to push them across, otherwise they might not have made it across. Um, Sarah King asks, do you think that being Fiverr's brother opens Hazel's eyes to the values of the undervalued? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. Um, that's one of the things that Hazel has, is that he has um, Fiverr as his example. He knows Fiverr's value. Um, and nobody else really takes Fiverr at all seriously. Um, yeah, Matthew uh, Hershenroder says, Frith never promised the rabbits will be strong, so the rabbits in the old Warren are doing rabbit wrong. Um, yeah, 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 they kind of were. They had left the path in some ways. Um, what Hazel is doing sounds revolutionary, and it is within his particular subculture there. But I, I agree with you, Matthew. I think that what we do see are ways in which what we will see more and more is that Hazel's value, Hazel's new concept, new anyway in the Sandalford Warren, um, new concept for how things should work, how what a Warren should be, his vision for what a Warren should look like, is, I think, much more in harmony with what we saw um, from Frith and Ella Herrera in that first story. Um, yeah. Um, even Pipkin, of course, is valuable. Um, even Pipkin has a role. All was confusion. This is, of course, in the Heather, in the common. All was confusion, ignorance, clambering, and exhaustion. Throughout the bad dream of the night's journey, Pipkin seemed to be always close beside him. Though each of the others vanished and reappeared like fragments floating around a pool, Pipkin never left him. 
and his need for encouragement became at last Hazel's only support against his own weariness. Not far now, Hleoru, not far now, he kept muttering, until he realized that, he had, that what he said had become meaningless, a mere refrain. He was not speaking to Pipkin, or even to himself. He was talking in his sleep, or something very near it. And of course we hear from the other rabbits that his continual repetition of not far now, although they were annoyed by it, um, actually also helped to keep them together and to guide them all in the same direction as they were crossing the heather. Um, remember, Hazel and Fiverr singled out Pipkin. They spent their whole time in that, that whole evening before they left the warren. He was the only rabbit that they brought, personally. Um, he was the only one of their friends that they convinced, that they even attempted to convince, because they spent the whole time trying to talk Pipkin into it. Why? Why did, you know, Pipkin... Um, is, I think, a really important character in this story. Um, Pipkin is the weakest... He's obviously the least useful rabbit of any of them. I mean, Pipkin has, like, no skills, <laughs> right? He's the tiniest, wimpiest... He's as small as Fiverr, for crying out loud. I mean, he's this little, little probably literally runty rabbit. Um, he is much weaker and 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 more cowardly than most. Um, he's not particularly smart. He's not particularly fast. Um, Kimberly asks, "Is he the youngest, or do I just think that because he's the weakest?" Yeah, we're not told that he's the youngest, but you're right. It seems like it, right? Um, and yet, he's the one that Hazel chose, right? If Hazel had to pick anybody out of the Warren to bring, he chose Pipkin to bring, right? Because Pipkin is valuable. Even though he's got no obvious skills, exactly, Ethan, he still has value. And, and we see here that, you know, in this, I love this passage, um, Hazel's care for Pipkin, you know, the choice that he has made to look out for Pipkin. Um, Pipkin's need for encouragement becomes Hazel's only support against his own weariness, right? It is only because Pipkin needs him that enables, you know, the knowledge that Pipkin needs him is what enables Hazel to go on. Um, yeah, Sarah says he shows everyone else how to follow Hazel. Um, yeah, <laughs> Brian says perhaps P Pipkin's advantage is that he's the most adorable. That is possible. Um, supreme cuteness might indeed be Pipkin's talent. Um, but, uh, but yeah, Pipkin is a great follower. There are ways in which we'll see, and I think we see more and more as we go through, Pipkin becomes, in my mind, he's like one of the iconic rabbits of this new Warren, you know, of this new vision of Hazel's. Hazel's vision is different in that it embraces rabbits like Pipkin instead of pushing them aside, right? Um, Pipkin would be like first and foremost, you know, in Toad Flax's world, Pipkin is like the first rabbit up against the wall, right? Um, when the revolution comes, but no, when the revolution comes, Pipkin is uh, I'm sliding into the other atoms here. Um, Pipkin is is the first one that they bring, right? That Hazel and Fiverr bring. Um, it I think illustrates his uh, his 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 true worth uh, more than more than anyone else. So anyway, I think. Um, and keeping an eye on Pipkin, I think, uh, is going to be an important thing. Um, more on Hazel's new vision, because we get a few other, uh, two other moments uh, that I want to look at that really illustrate it, I think, pretty well. Um, Bigwig comes back and reports the dog and is like, look, we've got to run, there's a dog coming, right? Pipkin and Fiverr can't run, they can't swim across. If they don't cross the stream, the dog is going to pick up their scent. Um, if he picks up their scent, there's no way they can escape from him. They have nowhere to bolt to, and Fiverr and Pipkin are too tired to swim the stream. Hazel thought through a kind of light-headed trance. Well, you'd better get on then, he said, and anyone else who wants to. He's talking to Bigwig, of course. Personally, I'm going to wait until Fiverr and Pipkin are fit to tackle it. You silly blockhead, cried Bigwig. We'll all be finished. We'll don't stamp about, said Hazel. You may be heard. What do you suggest, then? Suggest? There's no suggesting to be done. Those who can swim, swim. The others will have to stay here and hope for the best. The dog may not come. I'm afraid that won't do for me. I got Pipkin into this, and I'm going to get him out. Bigwig here is not being callous. Bigwig is not being a jerk. Bigwig is being the voice of mainstream rabbitry, right? This is the world, man. 
like you know, it suggest there's no suggesting to be done. What you do here is really obvious. There is a predator coming. Okay, when a predator is coming, we run away. Those who are able to run, run. Those who aren't, I'm awfully sorry about that. Maybe they won't get killed. It would suck if they did. But what can I do about that? Right? I mean, that's 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 the way it works. That's life. That's the world. Predators get slower, weaker rabbits. That's what happens. It's too bad, you know, but anyway, so again, I get no, I, I, I don't quote this to sort of illustrate anything negative about Bigwig. Um, this is the way the world works. Hazel's, what, rather, the reason I quote this is to emphasize how countercultural Hazel is being. The kind of courage that Hazel is showing here. Um, the kind of self-sacrifice that Hazel is 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 doing this. I'm going to stick with Fiverr and Pipkin and just sit here and just I will risk my life. The dog might kill me, but it but but I'm willing to accept that if that happens. I'm not going to run away even though I could, because I want to be here to help them. He, he he there's nothing he can do. Hazel is completely at his wit's end, and yet he's not going to abandon them. And that choice is weird. It's fundamentally strange. This is the thing that makes Hazel different. Again, but earlier on when he said, you know, I'm not, we're, you know, we're not going to run things this way. I'm not going to let outskirters just be bullied around. I'm not going to let Bigwig just run the show. Um, again, it sort of sounded like the disgruntled outskirter, right, who wants a little something for himself. Again, at least potentially that's how that could be interpreted. It's clear here. We see it's much, much deeper than that. Um, Hazel looks at things fundamentally differently, and the difference is with increased community, an increased sense of the importance of rabbits to stick together. He's going to stick to sticking together is more important even than fleeing, um, than even from fleeing against Elo and a dog for crying out loud. Um, dogs are like the biggest and most powerful of all of the the Elil that come after them, um, way bigger than foxes and weasels and cats and everything else. You know, the dog is like the, 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 you know, the, 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 the greatest, most enormous monster of the rabbit world. Um, but it's okay. He's going to, um, uh, he's going to, to, um, go in that direction. Kimberly is asking for clarification. What is a Lendry? A Lendry is a badger. Um, uh, there is, there should be in the back of your book, um, if you uh, weren't directed to it, a little Lapine glossary that will help with this. Um, so you can learn all of these important Lapine terms. A Lendry is a badger, um, which can kill uh, rabbits and sometimes kills uh, uh, rabbit kits, but they don't, uh, they're not generally, uh, they, they usually can't tackle a grown rabbit, certainly far too slow to catch uh, a, an adult rabbit. Um, Michael, yours doesn't have the glossary? That's appalling. That's appalling. How did you get a copy of Watertube down with no glossary? Um, that's awful. There should be one online, I hope. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, wow. Penguin books or Puffin. Yeah. It is not good. It is not good. Anyway. There isn't too much. Uh, it's most of it you can figure out. Most of it you don't need. Um, uh, but if you have any questions, we can we can well. We are we are here for you, Michael, to help you with the Lapine terms. Um, anyway, okay. Notice what happens later on when Hazel's vision is actually threatened in practice. This is of course the the uh, fight that breaks out between Bigwig and Hawkbit when uh, Bigwig is putting them in their place. And uh, I, I have to admit that Bigwig's stream of insults against Hawkbit and Speedwell and Acorn um, were one of the delights of my childhood. Um, I absolutely, you know, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, I just, I, I was, I was, uh, I really, um, indecently amused by his insults when I was a kid. There's been a fearful row 
Bigwig told Hawkbit and Speedwell he'd scratch them to pieces if they didn't obey him. And then Hawkbit said he wanted to know who was Chief Rabbit. And when, sorry, and when Bigwig, Hawkbit said he wanted to know who was Chief Rabbit, Bigwig bit him. It seems a nasty business. Who is Chief Rabbit anyway? You or Bigwig? I don't know, answered Hazel. But Bigwig's certainly the strongest. There was no need to go biting Hawkbit. He couldn't have gone back if he'd tried. He and his friends would have seen that if they'd been allowed to talk for a bit. Now Bigwig's put their backs up, and they'll think they've got to go on because he makes them. I want them to go on because they see it's the only thing to do. There are too few of us for giving orders and biting people. Frith in a fog. Isn't there enough trouble and danger already? Um, again, this is the first challenge, the first major deviation from Hazel's vision. In many ways, this moment is the first and most important challenge to Hazel's leadership. That moment on the bank of the Enborn was a big deal, right? Uh, and he got out of it not really through his own decisiveness or ingenuity. It was Blackberry's timely insight, of course, uh, into the, the property of floating wood, which enabled them uh, to cross. He gives the order, swim, everybody swim, right? But he, um, you know, but this is the moment. This is the moment, because it's not just about Hazel's leadership. It's not just a question of, are they going to follow him or not? It's a question of, what direction are they going to go? What's going to be the ethos of this new warren of rabbits, right? Of this new group of rabbits? Are they going to follow Bigwig? Which sounds like it will mean, based upon Bigwig's own personal leadership approach here, um, the, the traditional one, right? That if you don't obey... I will scratch you to pieces. It's as easy as that, right? I am bigger than you and stronger than you, and when I tell you to shut up, you will shut up, right? This is Bigwig's rather straightforward approach. And again, it seems totally normal, right? But that's not what we get. That's not what Hazel wants, right? Um, Arthur says Hazel uh, is, uh, is more into leaving by consensus building instead of by intimidation. Um, yes, yes, exactly. Um, yeah, Neil likes the sort of play on bigwig uh, in, that, uh, in, in, in that sense. Yes, it is an apt name for him in that way. Um, yeah, Sarah points out that notice that Bigwig didn't explicitly claim to be Chief Rabbit, right? Um, he responded by biting Hawkbit when Hawkbit asks him who is the Chief Rabbit. Um, and it's unclear how to take that. Is he biting Hawkbit because he's trying to shut Hawkbit up? Don't ask that question. It's a really sensitive question. I'm not prepared to talk about that. It, may, it might mean that. Um, or is he? Is that is an answer to the question? You know, who's the Chief Rabbit? <laughs> Does that answer your question, who's the chief rabbit? I mean, it could be seen um, uh, as, uh, uh, as an assertion of his authority, right? Um, but, but it's unclear. It's unclear to everybody else, right? And even that itself is a little bit strange. It's interesting to see the kind of influence that Hazel has been having on them already. He has been acting as their leader. He has been taking authority. He's the one who called them together. It was their idea to leave, right? He's the one who has said, we're going to be leaving. He's the one whose group people have been joining, and he's been aware of that. And he's been giving instructions, and he's been taking on himself the role of leader. But he's not the biggest, right? He's not the strongest. Bigwig should be the chief rabbit, right? Obviously. I mean, the one who, the most capable rabbit should be this. Yana thinks that Bigwig himself is conflicted. I think so, too. We have seen Bigwig act towards Hazel as a follower, right? He challenges him, he advises him, but he seems willing to go along with what Hazel says. And remember that Bigwig already himself showed signs of countercultural leanings while in the Sandalford Warren. Remember, he quit the Ausla and says the Ausla privileges don't really mean that much to him, right? Bigwig didn't fully buy into the system, it seems. Um, now, part of that, of course, as he says, is that a you know, big rabbit can pretty much make a way for himself wherever he goes. He's, uh, he's, he's, he's not bothered, right? He doesn't feel threatened. Um, Bigwig is very brave because he's very confident. Um, he knows that he's very strong and very capable, and he doesn't feel threatened, certainly by any of the other rabbits. He doesn't feel threatened by them. Um, and yet, he also has shown willingness 
to go along with Hazel. So that question, you know, the, the, the sort of tension or potential tension between Bigwig and Hazel, this is really the big determining question. What vision are we going to move forward in? Bigwig's idea, remember, was, hey, strong rabbit leaves the war and he can find a place for himself, right? Um, you know, he can push his way in somewhere else. A strong, heavy, good fighter is uh, always going to be able to make a place for himself. Is that what they are as a group? Are they going to follow that mentality? Is he going to be, is Bigwig going to be taken as like the, uh, the war leader of this traveling band, right? Um, that could happen. Right? They could fall on another small warren and kill them or drive them out and take their burrows. That could happen. That, that, that would be a move right? that they could make in order to, to, re to establish themselves. But there's this alternative, Hazel's alternative, right? this radical shift in culture that Hazel is trying to get. And he's, yes, I want them, I don't want them to go on because Bigwig makes them go on. I want them to go on because they see it's the only thing to do. I value them for themselves. I want them to understand. He wants them to buy in, not just because it will be better, it will work better, it will function better, though that's certainly true, but again, he's paying attention to them. Somebody who says, I'm the boss because I'm bigger and stronger, and you do what I say because I'll beat you if you don't, He's not thinking about you, they're thinking about them, right? Um, Hazel is thinking about the others, right? I want them to be, I want them to see, I want them to understand, I want them to realize there are too few of us for giving orders and biting people. But it's not just about fewness. If there were more of them, he doesn't want giving orders and biting people to be going on either. Um, and his... Uh, uh, <laughs> Nancy asks if he's right about Hawkbit. Would he in Speedwell have figured it out? Yes, uh, I mean, Nancy, you're right. Hawkbit and Speedwell are not, um, they're not that quick on the uptake. They're pretty thick-witted. Um, but that's okay. They have other excellent qualities, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, would they have figured it out? I don't know, but would they be able to see Perhaps they would. In the end, though, they, they he leads and they follow. Um, and this is his big trial as leader. And he recognizes, you know, it, you know he says, he promises rashly, right? Um, you know, in sort of this combination of a, of, a, of a leap of faith and a blind guess. You know, he says, if you follow me now, I'll have you out of this by the end of the night. Um, and he says, if I don't, they'd probably rip me to pieces anyway, and much good would it do them, right? He knows that, it, you know, this, this is their only chance, his only chance, is to lead them out now. So they put their faith in him, they follow him, and he does it, right? This is the first great affirmation of his, um, of his leadership. But again, it's not about, he still leaves it to them. Um, follow me, and I will lead you out. Not follow me or I'll scratch you to pieces. Right, still a huge gap. Much he's asking them to step up again. He's investing in them. Totally different point of view. Um, let's talk a little bit, though, about. Oh well, okay. Wait, one other thing. We can't forget though that Hazel is not. It's not like Hazel is a complete pacifist, right? We can't go to extremes and be like Hazel is all. You know, he's all against violence, right? He's not against violence. Um, remember Holly, right? He is Holly here. He was about to speak when Hazel faced him. Go, said Hazel, firmly and quietly, or we'll kill you. Do you know what this means? replied Holly. I am Captain of Ausla. You know that, don't you? Go, repeated Hazel, or you will be killed. It is you who will be killed, replied Holly. Without another word, he too went up the bank and vanished into the wood. I love the shift to the passive voice in that second threat that Hazel gives. Right? First, he says, firmly and quietly, a statement of fact. Go or we'll kill you. Um, we need to leave. 
we are going to leave. You are trying to stop us. If we have to kill you in order to leave, that's what we will do. Statement of fact. And we are we outnumber you significantly. So we will, in fact, kill you if you don't go. But then go, or you will be killed. Notice how he shifts it onto Holly's ground. The effect of using the passive voice there is, of course, the passive voice places the emphasis not on the doer of the action, but on the recipient of the action. I was always annoyed in high school when my English teachers told me never, never, never use the passive voice, like the rule of writing is never use the, like the passive voice is evil. The passive voice isn't evil. It has a legitimate use and an important use. Yes, it is terribly abused, often, by bad writers, and I totally understand why high school teachers say that, but there is uh, there is an important use of the passive voice, and that is when you want to emphasize the recipient of the action rather than the performer of the action. Um, and I think that this is a, an enormously effective, by Hazel, use of the passive voice. He places the emphasis on, you know, Holly, I'm thinking of you here, right? You can see this in so many different ways. Um, Ethan says he basically implies that Holly would be responsible for his own death, yes, in a sense. Um, I, but, but I think also it's like, my emphasis here is not on us, right? This is not we will kill you or I will kill you. Um, again, remember, Bigwig says to Hawkbit that he would scratch him to pieces if he if Hawkbit doesn't go along, right? And Bigwig uses the active voice, right? His emphasis is on the doer of the action himself, right? I personal, I want you, Hawkbit, to be thinking about me, Bigwig, scratching you to pieces, right? Hazel, when talking to Holly, says, "I want you, Holly, to think about yourself." being torn to pieces. It's not about who does it, right? You know, we're not bragging on ourselves. We'll, we're, 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 I, I, I want you to think about yourself here, right? Brian says it's an emphasis on Holly needing to make a choice. Yes, you have two choices, go or be killed. Choose, which would you prefer? Um, but this is one of those moments which might sound, again, it's another sort of really interesting rabbit worldview moment, to. From a purely human standpoint, this seems <clears throat> pretty harsh, right? I mean, this is one of those moments that really doesn't work as Beast Fable. If we imagine these, you know, the characters here as just being humans, if we just take the ex exact events of these story and we transfer them to human beings, um, this would feel very different, wouldn't it? you know, the leader of the new gang saying, go, or we're going to kill you. Not just we're going to, like, tie you up and gag you and, and, and run away, or not just we're going to club you over the head and leave you unconscious. We are going to kill, we're going to, you know, we're going to cut your throat and leave your body behind us. It seems awful in that, in that sense. That's not the world, though, that we're living in. We're living in the rabbit world. Um, you know, there's no, we're going to tie you up and, uh, you know, leave you where they'll find you in a day and a half. Um, there's no, I, I, there are, our, our options are more limited, and our view on violence and on killing is not the same as the human perspective on violence and killing. Um, so anyway, I, that's another thing that I thought was um, was was important, was sort of interesting in this in this moment. Um, yeah, Patrick says it also makes Holly know that there's no negotiation and no way out. Yeah, it all it does show how serious they are, right? No, 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 we're really leaving, right? If we have to kill you to make that happen, that's what we're going to do, right? Um, anyway, let's talk about Fiverr. We have a few minutes. We can talk about Fiverr. We're not going to finish our discussion of Fiverr. What I want to do today is start the Fiverr discussion. This, of course, is something we're going to come back to. The big question that I want us to be thinking about is, what is this book suggesting about Fiverr and Fiverr's prophecies? Um, can we build a rabbit metaphysic here? Um, what's happening? Um, how does Fiverr's prophetic faculty work? Um, how are we supposed to understand this story? Um, 
Yeah, and uh, both Kimberly and Nancy are, uh, and uh, Ed um, and Neil <laughs> are pointing out um, the connection between Fiverr and Cassandra. Of course, we get a quote from Cassandra as the epigram of chapter one uh, right there, of course, at the very beginning. Um, we clearly do get a connection there. Right, um, and uh, Adams owns that. You know that 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 the character of Cassandra uh, really inspired, um, you know, in, in, inspired the character of Fiverr uh, in many ways. Um, yes, but 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 that's not enough, right? That is okay. It's like Cassandra in some ways. Yeah, yeah. But what is it, and how does it work? Let's 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 look at a few examples. <clears throat> this is Fiverr's initial moment. The first time we see, you know, when when the bad feeling comes over him when he sees the notice board. Suddenly Fiverr shivered and cowered down. Oh, Hazel, this is where it comes from. I know now. Something very bad. Some terrible thing coming closer and closer. He began to whimper with fear. What sort of thing? What do you mean? I thought you said there was no danger. I don't know what it is, answered Fiverr wretchedly. There isn't any danger here at this moment, but it's coming. It's coming. Oh, Hazel, look, the field. It's covered with blood. Don't be silly. It's only the light of the sunset. Fiverr, come on, don't talk like this. You're frightening me. Fiverr sat trembling and crying among the nettles as Hazel tried to reassure him and find out what it could be that had suddenly driven him beside himself. He was, if he was terrified, why did he not run for safety as any sensible rabbit would? But Fiverr could not explain, and only grew more and more distressed. Why does Fiverr not run for safety? Why does Fiverr not run for safety? One, Michael, as you say, there's no immediate danger, right? Yes, it's sort of a differentiation between this sense of danger that he's feeling here and his answer to the question. Remember, Hazel, as Hazel was alluding to, Hazel asked him the question, you know, do you think it's not safe? Apparently, Fiverr does have a kind of insight, right? Even if there's something that no other rabbit can see, there's really no external reason to think it might not be safe over there, and yet Fiverr might know that it's not safe over there. Fiverr says, no, no, it's perfectly safe, and so Hazel's like, okay, well, let's go, right? One thing it's clear is to, to differentiate that. But yes, exactly, as a whole bunch of you are pointing out, uh, Gabrielle and Gerald and, uh, uh, and, uh, and Brian, and you know, the whole insight that he has is that the war in itself is the source of danger, right? To return to the whole which is the most natural thing to any sensible rabbit would bolt for the warren, right? But it's the warren itself that is the source of danger. That's where the danger is. And that's what's so crushingly, horrifyingly, terrifying to Fiverr, right? Is this oppressive sense of danger, and yet the knowledge that goes along with this insight into the presence of danger, that it's the warren itself, which is the locus, of the danger. Um, there is no escape, as Kat says, nowhere to run. Um, he's not safe even underground. And that's, uh, that's this, that's, that's, I guess it's terrible, right? Nothing worse than that. Um, notice how this works, though. He's not exactly uttering a prophecy. That is, he's not prophesying. He says that there's danger, something very bad, some terrible thing. He has this sense of it, but he can't articulate it, right? He's not making, uh, he's not making a specific prophecy. Um, Tom Hillman was pointing out, of course, that there's a major, there's major differences between Fiverr and Cassandra. The most, the biggest one, of course, is that nobody believes Cassandra, uh, and people do believe him now. Of course, there's a general echo of Cassandra, and that certainly, you know, the three are a response to Fiverr, as Cassandra does. The majority of the rabbits of the Sandalford Warren um, reply to, you know, uh, respond to Fiverr the way that most people, that everybody responded to Cassandra. But, of course, Fiverr's story isn't a Cassandra story, right? Because we don't have him placed under that kind of a specific curse where nobody is going to believe him. Um, but also, he's not being the kind of vision that Cassandra has. I mean, Cassandra, she's Trojan, and she knows what's going to happen. She knows that Troy is going to fall. Um, she sees 
pretty clearly the end of the war. Um, but you know, first the coming of the war and then the end of the war, but nobody nobody listens to her, nobody believes her. Fiverr is prophesying in a sense, but in a pretty vague sense, right? He has this you can't even call it a vision exactly, right? It's sort of a vision, but he doesn't see a picture, right? It's not like it's not like he sees the thing happening to the Warren that's going to happen to the Warren. And of course, we, the readers, are shown at the end of the chapter what's going to happen, right? Because we see what's on the notice board. We know that this lot of land upon which the Warren is located has been is going to is been set aside for construction, right? We can understand why. And it's if you think about it, it's one of the only times in the book, actually. One of the very few times in which we the readers are invited to think like people. Right? We are given a view. Our reading of the notice board is about the only time we in that sense see over the heads of the rabbits. I don't consider it a real breaking of the frame. Um, because what it does is kind of give a spoiler, right? It, uh, um, it, it allows us to sort of contextualize what Fiverr does. Um, but anyway, uh, good, as Brian says, he gets, he gets feelings, he gets sensations. Yes, he experiences fear as a rabbit would who saw something right there, right? Um, who was in the presence of Elil, say. Um, and yet he doesn't see it. He doesn't. So he he anticipates it. He experiences it. Um, I am reminded. Well, in the chronology of the book, it would be a foreshadowing um, of the way that the rabbits experience Dandelion's story. Right. That they. It's almost like they themselves are participating in it. Fiverr is participating in this thing that isn't there, but which he perceives and which he. Um, which he knows is coming. Then he gets that vision, right? The field is covered with blood, this sort of figurative, vague, general sense vision. I mean, of course, it's it's just, it's it's red with the sunset, right? Um, but he's given a kind of insight, right? No, that red light that is spilling over the field is only foreshadowing of the blood that's going to be there. Um, yeah, Emily, I agree. That's a really great way to, to say it. Um, Emily says that uh, the notice board gives instant credibility to Fiverr in the mind of the reader. That is, I, I agree, Emily, clearly the effect. Um, if there's one time we look over the heads of the rabbits in the book, that time is, to, is the one that basically solidifies us. There's no question in our minds whether or not Fiverr is trustworthy, right? Whether or not Fiverr's vision is, is crazed or not. We know it's not crazed, right? Um, in that one moment, we do know better than the rest of the rabbits, and we can see that Fiverr is right. Um, now, um, he, this is not it, right? This is not the only kind of manifestation of Fiverr's insight that we get. Again, notice also, or recall also, the implied one that we already, that I already mentioned. Um, that is the, uh, the, the, the exchange that Fiverr and Hazel have when they're going to hop across the stream when he asks them, is it safe? And Fiverr is like, oh yeah, it's fine, right? He seems to just kind of know these things. Um, but also, there's his dream. He does have dreams. When he wakes up there, chapter two, oh, Hazel. Oh, Hazel, I was dreaming. It was dreadful. You were there. We were sitting on water, going down a great deep stream, and then I realized we were on a board, like that board in the field, all white and covered with black lines. There were other rabbits there, bucks and does, but when I looked down, I saw the board was all made of bones and wire, and I screamed, and you said, swim, everybody swim, and then I was looking for you everywhere and trying to drag you out of a hole in the bank. I found you, but you said, the chief rabbit must go alone, and you floated away down a dark tunnel of water. Well, you've hurt my ribs anyway. Tunnel of water, indeed. What rubbish. Can we go back to sleep now? Hazel, the danger, the bad thing, it hasn't gone away. It's here, all around us. Don't tell me to forget about it and go to sleep. We've got to get away before it's too late. Um, as Cat points out, his dreams are more specifically prescient than his waking visions. Yes, he is, the insight that he got next to the notice board 
is powerful but not clear. <clears throat> his dream is clear but not intelligible. We'll come back to this because, of course, every little element in this dream does, in fact, foretell something that's going to happen. And by the time we get to the end of the book, we will have, we will have seen all of these things come to pass in different ways. And this dream will sound very different to us. Indeed, I plan to come back and talk about this dream again um, when we get closer to the end. We'll do it in the very last class, if not before. Um, because I think it's it's when we know the events that he is getting glimpses of, um, the glimpses that he gets and the way that he put that that it's put together for him here in this dream, I think tells a really interesting story. Um, so we'll, as I say, we'll come back to that. But um, notice, by the way, the first one of these already has come true by the end of today's reading. Swim, everybody swim, is what Hazel says to them when they're crossing the Enborn, right? As soon as Fiverr and uh, Pipkin are adrift on their uh, little board boat, right? Um, he says, swim, everybody swim. Um, so that's um, uh, that's that's already that's already come to pass. Or again, not not by this time, but by the time we get to the end of today's reading, um, Kimberly asks a fantastic question: Does Fiverr's insight only extend to danger, like an extension or amplification of Rabbit's cautious nature, or is it something totally outside of Rabbitness? Um, Kimberly, that's exactly one of the things that I want to get at. Is it how? unusual is it? I, I, I love the way that you put that. Um, his perception of danger does seem like a, a sort of a, a slightly supernatural, right? A, a slightly um, magical, maybe, extension of the general rabbit ability, right? Um, but, um, but there's more to it. And the dream, I think, clearly shows, uh, clearly shows more to it than that. Um, We'll see. Lauren wonders if his uh, bottom has been blessed uh, more than the bottoms of other rabbits. That uh, seems possible, though. It doesn't. It doesn't seem to be especially connected with his bottom. But of course, I see what you mean. Um, yeah. Well. Well. Again, we're gonna. We're gonna. I'm not trying to uh, answer these questions here today, but just rather to sort of to start this conversation and to begin us look begin us looking at this. Pay attention to this, uh, to the references to this that we see. Um, another illustration. <clears throat> no, we need to cross the river, Hazel, so we can, <clears throat> so that we can get into those fields, and on beyond them, too. I know what we ought to be looking for, a high, lonely place with dry soil, where rabbits can see and hear all around, and men hardly ever come. Wouldn't that be worth the journey? Yes, of course it would, but is there such a place? Not near a river, I needn't tell you that, but if you cross a river, you start going up again, don't you? We ought to be on the top, on the top and in the open. But Fiverr, I think they may refuse to go much further. And then again, you say all this, and yet you say you're too tired to swim. Notice the distinction between Fiverr's own capability, Fiverr's confidence, and Bigwig's confidence, right? Bigwig's fine, right? He's not afraid, generally, uh, because he's confident in his own strength. Fiverr, his vision, his confidence. Here again, he's like, yes, we should keep going until we find this high, lonely place. Um, and Fiverr's like, none of the rest of them want to even hear about this, right? And when Fiverr does tell him about the hills, when he sees the hills in the distance, the downs, and he's like, yeah, that's where we should go. And, and Hazel's like, you haven't told anybody else about this, have you? That is so far away. There's no way we're going there, and they're going to refuse to go if I try to tell them, right? It's way beyond Fiverr's own capability, right? The, I love the emphasis at the end of this passage here to the weakness of Fiverr's body, right? He can't possibly do, it seems, what he's saying they should do, and yet he knows what should be done. His role is very different. So, okay, so notice from here that Fiverr, Fiverr's insight extends beyond just danger, right? He, he has also this sort of positive vision, this positive intuition. I know the place where we should be going. I have a kind of picture in my head of what our destination should be. So his insight, his foretelling, is beyond just dangers coming look out. Um, one last moment, then I'll let you go. Fiverr gave no sign of having heard him. This is when they're talking about the hills there in the heather. He seemed to be lost in his own thoughts. When he spoke again, it was as though he were talking to himself. 
There's a thick mist between the hills and us. I can't see through it, but through it we shall have to go, or into it anyway. A mist, said Hazel. What do you mean? We're in for some mysterious trouble, whispered Fiverr, and it's not Elil. It feels more like, like mist, like being deceived and losing our way. There was no mist around them. The May night was clear and fresh. Hazel waited in silence, and after a time Fiverr said, slowly and expressionlessly, but we must go on until we reach the hills. His voice sank and became that of a sleep talker. Until we reach the hills, the rabbit that goes back through the gap will run his head into trouble. That running, not wise. That running, not safe. Running, not... He trembled violently, kicked once or twice, and became quiet. Again, the question is, what's happening here? How does Fiverr do this? What's going on with Fiverr here? Again, not trying to answer this question, and we'll come back to this passage certainly next time. Um, many of the things that he says here will make more sense by the time we come to the end of book one uh, for, for the next class. Um, do read the rest of book one uh, for class next week. I look forward to talking about the next challenge uh, in this uh, stage of their journey. And we will keep looking at these passages and continuing. We will get some, I think, some very interesting insight into what goes on with Fiverr next time um, in uh, one of the passages that I find most fascinating in this whole book, actually. Um, don't forget, this coming weekend is the Mythgard Webathon. It's going to be a lot of fun. The culmination of our uh, of our um, uh, of our fundraiser, um, and of course, I didn't emphasize before, which I probably should, that uh, it's through, of course, our fundraiser that people get to participate in our proceedings here. So, you know, everybody who donates uh, to our campaign gets to vote on the books that we're going to talk about next. We're talking about one of my favorite books now, which I, I, I was delighted was elected at the end of the year. Um, if you want to talk about one of your favorite books and would like to, uh, to, to be able to elect it, everybody who uh, contributes to the campaign gets a vote uh, proportional to the amount that you give uh, in, uh, in, in what books we talk about next. Everyone who donates $100 or more gets to be part of the council that can nominate um, books and decide on the slate of finalists that goes to the entire uh, set of, of, uh, of, of voters. So uh, just a reminder that that's how it works, that there's still time uh, for you to be able to, to uh, contribute to our next year's proceedings. So again, Saturday, the 8th of November, at 5 p.m. Eastern Time will be the beginning of our webathon, which should be a lot of fun. Look forward to seeing you guys there and to talking more about Watership Down next week. So thanks very much, everybody, and I look forward to uh, I look forward to talking to you guys more then. Thanks. Good night. <laughs>